Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our next episode of Six Feet Under Exhumed. I am Carrie the Mortician. I'm Faith, that mortuary professor, and this is episode seven, yeah. and it is The Brotherhood. Oh, such a good one. It is a good one. It's I sad. think because it's veterans and brothers and, you know, it's part of our whole huge storyline is the brothers, Nate and David. And so, yeah, why don't you talk about kind of how it opens and what- Yeah, so it, it opens up with this young man making a video to send home and he is deployed somewhere. I don't know that it says exactly golf. Maybe the golf was it? I know. I think it was Iraq because they say later yeah. what they made him do because anyway yeah well he's deployed somewhere and he's making a video to send home and all of his you know uh comrades are goofing off and all of that and then you see him in a hospital um and someone comes into the room um and he's passed away and he's very young i think he was 30 years old and so he had served and had medical issues related to that because of that and passed away at a very young age. Um, and his brother is the one that is meeting with uh, the Fishers to plan services for him. And his brother is very anti-veteran, very anti, you know, whatever that experience was and um, just says, you know, I just want to cremate him and put him in a box and and that's said that he doesn't he doesn't want any any kind of services or anything. He just wants to kind of get everything done quick and and that'll be that. Um, he kind of blames the service, I think, because he said yeah. they believe it's Gulf War syndrome. He's he was exposed to chemicals because of what they were putting together to um, you know, go against the other troops and stuff. And so he had fought for years while his brother was been had been in the VA hospital to try to get things for him and had been his biggest advocate and hated the service. And his brother kind of just went along with what he said. Yeah. And the last episode when we were recording made me think of this because you were talking about how people talk the way, sometimes it's nice to hear like Mr. Jones in the last one talked the way you wish people would. And Nate comes in while Dave is meeting with this brother and he's mm -hmm. like, man, you were the, you were the best wrestler, dude. Like, oh my gosh. And just was super casual with him in a way that the guy liked. Yeah. And so it kind of really shows the two sides of how you can be a funeral director and connect sure. people in different ways. Like you don't have to be this stoic, perfectly postured, correct terms, you know, what kind of receptacle would you like to put your brother in after? And he goes, a paper bag will do. And Dave's yeah. just, Dave's mortified literally by all of this. No military honors, no viewing, no casting, yeah. no burial, no service, like mortified yeah. that he wants that. Yeah. Yeah. And Nate, I, Nate went to high school with the guy and, you know, yeah. is, is talking about some, you know, just that for a little bit, but, but Carrie's right. You know, you, we're not robots and we're not, we're not just order taker undertakers either. And I've laughed in more arrangements than I think more arrangements looking, looking back over my career. I don't know if you feel the same, but I say more arrangements are positive mm -hmm. um, and not, I want to say they're fun, but they aren't, you know, very, and it does happen where there's families that are just very, very sad and very quiet, very, all of that. But I, but for me, at least in my experience, the majority of people, you know, once they kind of relax a little bit and see that you're a real person, mm -hmm. kind of open up a little bit more and, um, you know, you can be yourself, you know, a, a little bit more, but knowing when to be super professional and when to be just a regular person is a skill right. and um people i think people want to know that they're dealing with real human beings and not robots yeah we have we have interests and they might be similar to your family or we have family structures what i have always seen negative on is when people try to connect saying oh i've lost someone too that to me is something that doesn't belong in the arrangement room oh. because our loss that we've had in our lives, I just don't think it, it has a place trying to connect with families because they're hearing that enough from all these other people that they don't need someone else trying to 
make their loss the same as what this family in front of us is feeling. And um, we had a lady that worked at a funeral, one of the funeral homes and her adult son had died. And every time someone lost a child, she would grab them out in the hallway and be like, oh, I just, I know exactly how you're feeling. My son died. And I had this woman come up to me and she's like, you know, you might want to talk to her. She's like, my 17 year old son dying is not at all the same as her adult son dying of cancer. So it's probably not good for her to say those things to people. And I've heard that multiple times in different scenarios over the years. And so, and I one one time and I regretted it as soon as it came out of my mouth, said something to an uncle of a child we were burying. Him and I were kind of, he was kind of one of the point people. And I said, you know, my niece was killed and I just know blah, blah, blah. And as soon as I said it, I was like, I did what I absolutely despise people doing, but it just naturally came out and I wasn't trying to like downplay his or anything. And it just, it can really be trite and come off as downplaying what they're going through. And Mm -hmm. so bad to do, especially when it's children or babies or things like that. You know, it's just, it is because we don't know the dynamics there. You know, I've lost, we've, I've lost my dad. I've lost, you know, I lost a, I mean, everybody has, has had losses, but the relationships are different, you know? Mm -hmm. So just because somebody else's dad died, doesn't mean I know how they feel because they may have had a completely different kind of relationship. Everybody's walk is their own. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and I think it's natural for us to want to connect with people and just the way, the way that we do that in, in every other aspect of our lives is through finding some kind of common ground Mm-hmm. And and trying to express empathy, and that's a very natural way to do it. But you're right in in those situations, it's not helpful in mm-hmm. any way. It doesn't help me to know that your dad's dead too. Nope. You know, and so it, it's and and I think most people w- aren't going to be offended by that. But it's not it's not helpful in any way. And there's there's other things that you know that we can do or or say that that might be better in those circumstances but it's natural to want to connect with people yeah. you know with something that they're that they're going through but if i've learned anything in funeral service in 20 years it's that families are screwed up and mine was my family screwed up too but i can only imagine the ways that other people's families are screwed up so you have to be really really careful to be you know assume everybody's situation is like yours because right. it's not. Well, when we see Nate, um, he's exhausted and is like, dude, I've, I've, I've run it on like an hour of sleep. Cause I did all this. And he's like, yeah, get your butt in here. Like this is the life and this is what we're doing. And so mm-hmm. he's really kind of struggling with some of the time consumption that funeral directing brings and the, um, you know, demands of, he you really know, is all and going and picking up deceased and mm-hmm. uh, all of all of that and learning that uh oh this is this is a lot. Well, it's interesting that if Federico makes a comment to him. They Nate is trying to get out of the elevator and can't yeah. get it out. And he's like, "I'm gonna somebody's gonna cut somebody's finger off." And Federico goes, "Well, you never cared about it before. It was your finger, exactly." And it's just kind of one of those comments of like you know, owner versus employee kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, excuse me, I have to sneeze. <laughs> Sorry oh, about that. Bless you. Thank you. Um, but you could just, just kind of reminding you that Federico kind of feels very much pushed out or to the side or very insecure in his position there now that, you know, Nate and David are in charge. Um, and, you know, so, so I just, that, that comment stuck up to me. Like you didn't care about it before it infected you, you know? Yeah. And I think of, a lot of people have something they can kind of relate to with yeah. that at their work where they're like, Hey, what about this? No, it's fine. And then as soon as that other person encounters it, they're like, Oh, we got to change this or we got to do this. Oh, now this it's or- a problem. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's great. That's, yeah. And I think, you know, in small business, I own a small business and, and I think we're guilty of that there too, where it's like, we don't want to spend the money on this. So we'll just work around it, work around it, work around it, even mm-hmm. though everybody's complaining about it, you know, but then eventually, you know, when you do finally go ahead and pull the trigger and fix something or get a new piece of equipment or everybody, everybody's like, Oh, okay. Now it's now you, now you're going to do it. But I don't know. I mean, 
as a as an owner, I don't know if I would if an elevator if it was working if if even if the door would stick. I don't know if that'd be on my priority list either. But no, you know, I can definitely see it, it. It's kind of maybe that that comment of well, you're not the one that uses it, so of course you don't care, kind of thing, you know? Because there's there's that trope of like owners that that don't actually do the work, which is not the case in that funeral yeah. home, but truth you know um but they they bring this young man into the prep room um and you know he has medals um taped to his chest and he has some paperwork in his file that kind of give the impression that he did want military honors and a military you know involvement in military you know kind of a funeral um and maybe his brother wasn't aware of that and again this is just one of those cringy things that that it just makes me go oh gosh when rico was like he's like oh he's a direct cremation and rico's like that's bullshit that's true you don't just burn people right yes you do you yes you can there is nothing you're not you're not making a bad decision there's nothing cremation is is another option it is not less than burial it is not yeah. you know bad in any way so that was kind of like oh you know but some people just loves and balmy too. though and he yes. loves and wants to show everybody what he can do he sure. reminds me a lot in some ways of john t hill yes. who we'll have on here as yes. a guest um fabulous embalmer so excited when he talks about embalming and what can be done and why you embalm and mm. You know, he just wants the opportunity to ha- get in front of every person to get them to believe in embalming like he does and the viewing and everything. And that's kind of how he remind how Federico yes. reminds me. Yeah. It's I just, gosh, when they do those things in that, in those shows, I'm like, oh God, people are going to think we're all down there judging people because they're cremating or what. And we're really oh, not. No. Um, they, they do show two embalming scenes kind of towards the beginning. The one David is embalming a gentleman and has a cannula, which is the um, instrument that goes from the machine and the tubing into the artery. And he's got that in and he's got suture string holding it perfectly because you use some of the suture string to tie it down so it doesn't shoot out if the pressure is weird. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so, that's legit. Like ever set that visual up point on yeah. and then um federico's embalming the veteran or the soldier not having authorization to do so mm-hmm. but he's embalming and you know the fluid's looking good and the setup's like legit it, good stuff yeah it's well researched and and it's it's shown much i think a lot more clean maybe than than it is in real life i mean a prep room is an active place with a lot of people working and it's not a sterile or by any means um so they definitely make it a lot more um tidy or you know i mean there's just one or two people in there but um, no, I the the setup that they have the the machines are all accurate. The instruments are accurate. The, everything that I've seen for the most part, you know, this far has been yeah, yeah. Just don't embalm without authorization. Please That's don't embalm it. without authorization. They do but- so many things that are like, oh my gosh, you would be sued and the whole place would be shut down. Like Absolutely. they do little things, and I'm like, oh, do not do that. Like so illegal, but. I think the intention that Nate had was decent because he thought he should do what the guy wanted in his paperwork because we, we keep learning along the way that Nate talks a lot about what he wants for himself Mm -hmm. and wanting himself to be advocated for if the TAM came and he jokes about a brain tumor in one of these episodes and uh, so much foreshadowing hate to give away but a little foreshadowing of maybe something's coming and um all of that is like oh my gosh i never even would have picked it up unless you've seen the whole series and you know and sorry guys little spoiler alerts but yeah um and we got mom goes and asks for a job from nikolai at the flower shop so the man she doesn't want flirting with her she goes and asks for a job so she can work alongside him every uh-huh. day. Yeah. Hmm, mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She likes the attention for sure. Oh, yeah. If it, mm-hmm. it makes her feel a way I think she hadn't felt in years. Absolutely. And it's kind of, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I think a lot of people have been there where it's like there's somebody interested in you that you're not really interested in, but the attention feels good. Mm-hmm. So maybe you're just like having a bad day. So you like let them pay attention to you or that kind of thing. That's what she's doing. Um, 
and again, it's interesting that they don't just shove her away as a widow. She's actually like a, still a person experiencing it yeah. at 60 or whatever What's she is. Going on? She still doesn't, they, like when you're 60, you still don't know how to date and how to deal with everybody. So it's, it's still clunky and messy and, and awkward and weird. And so I appreciate that about it because um, so many other TV shows, I feel like once you're over a certain age, you just, you're only you're a grandma. grandma. Yeah, that's your grandma it. or your grandpa yeah. or your, like a side piece kind of storyline. Yeah. And she, during this episode, Hiram comes over and makes dinner for everybody because he's like this world class <sighs> chef, which we didn't know yeah. about him. Yeah. And they make this dinner and her hair is down. I love when her hair is down. Like it's a whole different version of her. Yeah. And but so then she- Nate and David keep like having these intrusive thoughts of Claire them. Did too about that. Oh, like- yeah. Yeah, like grabbing at each other and doing it on the counter and all sorts of, like, don't think about your parents like that. Like, or you know, even if it's one, yeah, that's just weird. It is weird, but I think it just goes to show it's kind of like the first time that they're seeing their mom is like somebody. A sexual like, being. An actual person that has relationships because, you know, you grow up with your mom and if your mom and dad are married and together and, you know, through your childhood and adulthood, like. You probably don't see a lot of that, I would think, but also you don't really think about it because you, in the, but then you see like your parents start to date somebody else or do this and you're like, oh my God. Yeah. And then your mind just, it has these horrific visions and that's what's happening to them. And it's so funny. Well, and I'm like, I I hope when I'm 70 that I still have desires and want to be physical or, you know, I'm hoping that that's the case when I'm 80 whatever you know kind of thing mm-hmm. i i think we would all want to have sure. that capability and desires at that point and still be sure. a woman and oh yeah but it's stuff. still even you know when you're the age of like nate and david in their in their 30s it's still absolutely horrifying to think about your parents having oh, yeah. sex which is just uh, funny to me i'm that. just looking at my notes i yeah. think uh, kind of rounding out the mom in this episode you know, they show her working at the florist and she does a great job and she's making good, you know, observations and recommendations to people. And then um, the other guy that works there says, oh, she's out crying. And off he goes running. Um, what's his name? Uh, Nikolai. Thank you. Nikolai goes running to her and he's like, what is wrong? Why are you crying? She goes, they just, everything smells so beautiful. And um, I just didn't, know that joy could be correlated to flower smell as well. She said, because I've been around death smelling flowers for so long. And she said, my whole day today has been filled with so much joy. And she said, I cannot wait to come to work tomorrow. And it's like, oh, like I would have never thought about that, I guess, when it comes to flowers and, and never correlating them to maybe a joyful occasion but so cool that's true and for me that that's i don't like flowers because of i mean i like flowers uh, but they're not that special to me i guess because to me they're work and it's like i'm like oh my god i gotta carry this vase and dump the water out and get it on my shoes and get all the flower crap on my jacket and all that so like to me they're they're kind of a pain in the butt because yeah. I you know, we've had to move them all over creation. We've had to get them all over everything. And so for me now, I I don't buy them ever. And I rarely like get them because to me, they're just like, uh, now I got a vase that I got to yeah. find some put and all of that. So it is nice to see her. I think that that does happen to us with things that, that become work that aren't just for funerals. And then you forget that. Oh, they are nice that people do do like these, you know. Well, I think yeah. how she phrased it, she said something like, "When people are shattered, is when I smell flowers." Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Gosh, shattered is such a great word for it." Um, yeah. you know, such a great word. But I just thought that was such a interesting observation by mom. And then we've got Claire, who we see this big scene where she's in school, so we're gonna get into her and friendships and relationships a little more again. And we're watching the math teacher who's going berserk on this math equation. And she's like, well, Claire, if you paid attention, she's like, I don't need to know this. And the teacher's like, yes, you do. If you're going to be a physicist or something, she's like, well, I'm not. So 
who cares? And, you know, you see that she understands that most people are in this one track that you go to school, you study this, you take your LSATs and your tests yep. and you do all this stuff and then graduate and you go to college and you do this. And she's kind of just like, yeah, that's not me. And I don't want to be that person. I don't want to do those things and it's okay. But she's kind of toying with, do I play the part? Do I not play the part? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know why I noticed this, but I'm like, oh, a chalkboard with chalk. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I not a whiteboard. Or, yeah. it's now. I'm like, oh man, look at that. Um, but no, I mean, she's definitely getting to that point where, you know, she has to decide what she's going to do after high school. And at that time in the world, again, Claire and I are the same age. Uh, every you had to go to college. What do you like? That was just expected. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can we the whole different show is what that led to for our you know economy and world and all of those things. But huh. um, that was really the expectation back in the early two the late nineties, early two thousands, at least for people you know, my age that were graduating in the year 2000. And it was like, you, everybody goes to college. Like you, you just do. And if you don't even know what you want to go for, you just go for like English or something until you figure it out. Liberal like studies. Yeah. Liberal studies. There you go. But not going to college was like, it was, it was, it meant something negative about you. And yeah. I'm, it's not that way. I feel like that's changing now um, where we oh, are today. Sure. Trades are so huge. But yeah, but absolutely. She feels like I'm supposed to go to college, but I don't know what I want to do or if I even want to, but you can't say that you have to just keep doing what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, but she doesn't, doesn't really want to. And that's, that's interesting. And then, you know, I, it's not in this episode, but it's not really a spoiler, but uh, probably the next one or the next couple, she has a conversation with Ruth about how I would have given anything to be able to go to college. So it's kind of that generational difference, too, of like her mom didn't have an opportunity to go to college because she had to get married and, and raise kids. That's what was expected of her. And she can't believe that her daughter doesn't want to go to college because that's all she ever wanted to do. Right. So it's a lot there. Uh, she's I love Claire and she does develop a lot in the next two, three episodes with kind of some of what she learns. I think one of the upcoming, she says something like, um, everything I thought was true really just wasn't. She said, and I just keep realizing this more and more that what I thought about life just isn't how it is. Yeah. And it's kind of like, yeah, I think everybody goes through that in these waves of, wow, this isn't how I thought it would be or this isn't how I thought things would go and stuff. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, this is the episode where we do the deacon. They're going to okay. have this yeah. um, associate priest, I think is what they are. And they, so the deacons and the board are all together and they're just, they're trying to push to make sure they make the right decision. And Dave's kind of the last person that needs to give approval and interviews the guy. And they're like, well, does he seem gay? And Dave's like, well, how would I know? And then you do talk to the one guy that works at the church and he's pulls out his whiskey and is like, Hey, do you want a drink? And, you know, it was a little more, not as conservative as you think. I'm not going to say liberal, but just not as conservative and straight laced as maybe you think. And maybe he is more open to somebody coming in to change things up a little bit. And Dave's like, no. Yeah. No, let's not. Yeah. It's in. Yeah. And, and that comment that was made by that other person on the board was like, well, you're just putting young people on this board now. So they radicalize everything. Yeah. It's like David's the least radical person. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, because I think if it got radical, it would shine a light on him. Yeah. And so if we keep anyone who might be gay away, then they're not going to realize that Dave's gay. And right. I think he just is so stuck in wanting to be viewed a certain way mm -hmm. that it's like, come on, dude, like at some point you got to be happier. And you see the scene where he's in his apartment and he's like laying out his clothes for the next day. And they're all meticulously like hung and put and straightened. And then he takes his cup of his glass of milk and this perfect white towel. And he goes and sits on the chair and you think he's going to like eat cookies. No, he's turning it on and going to watch porn. Yeah. And it's just like, it's kind of, 
it's just funny. Like, dude, you're just human. You don't, you don't have to pretend to be this other version. You can be this great middle version rather than Mm -hmm. one or the other. And it'll Mm -hmm. be fine kind of thing. And, um, yeah, he's so, he's so funny to me. Um, all of it. Yes. And then yeah. Federico gets a call from Kroner um, while he's sitting eating lunch in the prep room next to the bodies, which is not a good idea. Cringe wouldn't, again. Wouldn't do that. Wouldn't do little, that. A little OSHA problem there. I yeah. Think. Um, yeah. So they're like, hey, will you come do this or the other? They don't really tell us in that episode mm-hmm. what Kroner's asking or what they're offering. Right. But you know that the groundwork is. Mm-hmm. being laid by yeah. the corporate to come yeah. after him. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So they want to poach him from Fisher and sons. And, you know, um, again, we don't really know all that, all that detail in this episode of what, what that's all about, but you know, it, it just kind of it does lay that groundwork of he has other options maybe. And he maybe never realized he had other options and it's intriguing to him. Um, to think that, oh, I could go work somewhere else maybe that appreciates me more mm-hmm. or that maybe will pay me more or that this or that. And it's a, it's a, it causes conflict within him because I think it, it does for anybody, you know, mm-hmm. um, when you've worked somewhere for a long time to think of leaving, even if it might be a better situation for you but with all that it just happened with kroner i think that it's almost feels maybe like he's turning on the fishers and you know all of that because there is such a such a family versus corporate spin in this show Mm -hmm. that was true at one time um there's still some truth in it but something like 88 percent of funeral homes are small family owned businesses stuff. Yeah, it's like fi- I I I read 15% is only corporate run. Yeah, something was one like of the that. last yeah. that I saw and it's I think people think that so much is corporate. It doesn't mean it's small family owned. It's not like oh, you have a whole bunch of members of one family, but it could be just one person owns it. It's independently owned independently. or corporate. Yeah, yeah. I mm-hmm. hate when it's the family run cases yep. because that I feel like means that there's generational family and you have multiple family members and stuff. So I, I think that's not the case 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 at all. Um, Yeah. Independent versus corporate is better. Definitely. I think that makes sense to me just in terms. And we kind of uh, like towards the end of this is the service for the soldier. And, you know, Nate really, really got ballsy and he sets up this little gathering of people from the VA and people that knew the soldier and his urn is sitting there and there's about 15 people there and they're sharing stories about him from serving alongside him, from being at the VA, whatever it is. And his brother walks in and says, Hey, I'm here to pick up his cremated remains. He said, well, he's in here. And some of his friends just wanted to gather with him hopefully this is okay. And he's like, what? And then before they can even answer the guy who served with him says, Hey, are you, or he go, they were like, this is his brother. And he advocated and was such a hero for him trying to get him benefits and everything and gives them these pictures of him and, um, kind of glazes over the fact that they have just had a service without asking the brother and set up burial with honors without asking the brother. And the brother kind of goes along with it until they get to the cemetery and they hand him the flag. And then it's like, Oh, he's like, yeah, I don't want any part of that. Yeah. So that kind of changes that part as well. That's a, oh, that's a, it's kind of a cringy storyline a little bit because I think, you know, it's, it's not uncommon that a family wants something different than maybe the person would have wanted, yeah. but a funeral home is not going to just say, here's what the person wanted, whatever family, we're going to do it. You don't, right. you don't embalm somebody without authorization. You no. don't have a service. You don't, you don't let of, you know, people that aren't the, the next of kin or the, the authorizing party just come and have a service for somebody. Right. Like it's just, that's, that's a, a good way to get sued. 
And yeah. so I don't, what I don't, what I don't like about it is they do all these things and it just ends up being okay. Um, because that's, that's not very realistic. We, you, you wouldn't really do that. I mean, you might advocate for somebody a little bit or, or discuss, you know, the different options or the different things with families for sure. But you're not going to just be like, well, he wanted to be, in, he wanted this. So we're just going to do it. And the family will, will come around and have this, this realization that this was the right thing to do all along and everything will be fine. That's not what's going to happen. They're going to be mad and they're going to sue you. So, you know, maybe don't do that, but yeah. it turned out. Okay. And he rejects the flag. He doesn't want to take the flag and that's okay. But his brother kind of got what he wanted and the, he got what he wanted. And so in the end it turned out okay. And then, Nate and Dave have this moment at the cemetery, which is, I don't know. I feel like there's some foreshadowing in it as well, but it's, it's this beautiful moment. And Nate just hugs him and is like, Hey, I love you. Like, and you need to know that because we don't say it and we don't have that together often, but I love you kind of thing. And yeah. then Dave reciprocates and says it back and it's kind of this beautiful. And then it closes at that. And it, it kind of mm-hmm. leaves you on this, like, Oh, what's, what's going to happen? <laughs> like, is their relationship going to change? Is this just a moment? Is this, how does this go? And so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Did we talk about Billy? We didn't talk about Billy in this episode. Was he in this episode? I think that's the next one. Are you sure? Yeah, that's the next one. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself then. They're all blurring together again. I know they do. Oh. No, Billy, but Billy goes cuckoo for Coco's in the next episode. It's the next one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But- so, yeah, watch for that coming in the next one. So this is an interesting episode, though, f- about veterans, and I think it's worth talking about just for a minute. How many people uh, that are veterans don't know what benefits? Oh gosh, so many, and it's, it's so it's so, it's so sad to me because I feel like you know the VA or the veterans groups or whatever don't do a good job of educating veterans on what their death benefits right. are, and there's right. so many misconceptions. So I guess anything out of this episode, if you're if you're not in the funeral business to take away is if you are a veteran or your family member or loved one is research that stuff ahead of time, because I think you'll be surprised both by what is not right given to you and what is. And so many people have no idea. And so many assumptions are made about veterans benefits that mm-hmm. make it difficult at the time of death, because how many families have you had that say, well, he was a veteran. Everything's paid for. Not even close. A ridiculous not amount. Bit. Yeah. A ridiculous. And they did say, like in this episode, they talk about possibly what veterans benefits are available. And mm-hmm. he does, he can get like up to 1500 or something is what they tell him. Well, he did die in a veterans yep. hospital. So yep. dying in a veterans hospital, you can get a little bit more financial benefits from sure. it. Um, and so he did get like 1500 or whatever they said, and, um, kind of covered the cremation covered, you know, getting him buried and everything. Yeah. So that was kind of nice that Nate did get those lined up for yeah. the brother and kept telling him when he did show up was like, none of this costs you, none of this costs you, none of this costs you. And so I think that also helped glaze things over with the brother. For sure. So. However, most of that is reimbursement to the family. The family has to pay out of pocket and then they're reimbursed. So that was a little inaccurate to kind of perpetuate the idea that, well, it's all paid for the, because of this, this, and this. It's a reimbursement. The family still has to pay and then mm-hmm. file for reimbursement with the VA. So I just, ooh, I don't know. I wish, you know, they, they can't do everything in the show, but I feel like with the veteran stuff, um, Oh, that's just one thing that always as a funeral director was a, a pain point for me is was what people assume that they get because they were a right. veteran and you don't, you just don't. No. So well, research what you do get is kind of, you know, battling along the way to get it. And mm-hmm. I think anybody that's been in the system that goes to the VA hospital that tries mm-hmm. to get care through knows that it's not a, the easiest system to work through. I think one of the biggest things that families will walk in and go, well, we don't have the DD-214. We don't have their discharge paper, but it's on file. It's fine. No, there is no central connecting database within the military system for us to be able to just go get it, for us to call the VA hospital and for them to quickly get it to us. Like We have to physically provide it to the cemetery 
for a national cemetery, they cannot just go in and pull it. There's yep. nothing is connected in there. And it's like, how? With a I know, family. isn't it? it I understand why have. people would assume that, but it's not. If you don't have that discharge document, you know, you have to go through National Archives, which can be weeks long yeah. before, and you can't do anything till you have it. Mm -mm. You know, we can't just call the VA and be like, oh, we need to know is this. They, they don't have it. It doesn't work like that. Um it it should that'd be a lot a lot nicer that but be it nice does, to get it? in right you do there you go here it's all set yeah it's a bit ridiculous that and then wasn't nice. it there was a fire like years ago and they lost like yeah and millions this is, of they lost like 80 over 80 percent of records for yes. army and i think army air corps i did a video on it i couldn't it's been a little bit since yeah. i researched and did the video but yeah a lot of records they were able to recreate or at least do a letter that said yes we can verify but we can't right. give all the details because they're not all there but they can go in and try and recreate the file and recreate information for a veteran there are times though that there is zero they can do we have nothing that shows your loved one was a veteran was honorably discharged uh, we're we're out like they will not provide benefits they won't do any honors they won't do anything because they can't prove it's not that they can't prove they serve but they can't prove how they were discharged and it has to be honorable to be able to get anything yep so and i guess there, there's there's our tip for you i guess today if you're a veteran or your loved one is get your paperwork straight research what death benefits are and are not available to you don't go in blind because um you're going to be surprised and it's not going to be in a good way no. And you're yeah. going to really dislike the funeral director for telling you, sorry, no, you know, you know and the, the um, four funeral directors, you know, we, we have to, we have to bear the bad news of so many families for well, things we don't control and it's no fun. And, and, you know, we need to do, somebody needs to do a better job of educating veterans is the point. And I don't know who that is. Well, but, but the veteran system, you know, look at the, uh, the ads from the national cemetery, get a free burial. If it's I not, heard those words, I would I know. believe the whole thing was free. No. Everything. But that's mm -hmm. not what it means. It means you have a grave space, a headstone, and a vault. That's what and it You don't means. get to pick where it is either. You just get the next assigned grave. Nope. At a national cemetery. And so you, it's just it's, the, yeah. the presentation of the information is ambiguous on purpose, I think, which I think is crappy because it really does make veterans believe Mm -hmm. That they can give, especially when the veteran comes in and the the spouse has died and they are holding their discharge paper. Because I had this recently and God, it broke my heart. And he's like, I have this so that I can bury my wife. And I know that it's all free because I have this. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, and it just it does me to have to tell him, I'm sorry, that's not the situation, but we will do as much as we can for you. But. Yeah. You still have a bunch that you have to pay for. Yeah. And yeah. that's horrible. We are, it, it doesn't allow us to create a great relationship with families because we have to kind of kick them at their knees right off the bat. Yeah. We have so to, to we have to bear that, give them that news that they hear their whole lives and thought, well, I, I'm a veteran. And when I die, everything's taken care of. Yep. It's not even, not even close, not even, not even a little bit. Yep. And so, you know, oftentimes, and, and people don't, they don't do a lot of research about death benefits in the first place, because nobody wants to think or talk about it. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, a whole nother thing. But because they don't look into that on their own, they don't know. And it's not, it's not like when you get discharged, you go through a seminar on what your death benefits exactly. are. There's nothing like that. You know how many veteran friends I have that have no idea, none. No, but they don't, they don't talk about that in the, with them. And they well, don't on, go looking for that. But on there's the just discharge a at the bottom. Have you ever seen this? A lot of discharges at the bottom say life insurance, like Ten or twenty thousand dollars, because when they were in the service, we were in. that was part of being in the service. Is you had this life insurance attached, and it's listed on there. It's not still there. So I have exactly. people come in and go, "Oh, this says that they have life insurance and their veteran." Bang, and I'm like, mm, "Gosh, sorry, no again." It's well, another thing that happens that you know, and it's it's okay. It's a business practice, but it's also confusing to veterans. Is there are some funeral homes I can. 
speak just about the Denver area where I live, there are some funeral homes that advertise themselves as mm -hmm. veteran funeral homes. They're not. They've just decided to do that as their business thing. And that's that's fine. But they're like, you get a free cast, you know, they get a free 20 gauge minimum metal or yeah. something. You know, so there are funeral homes that have different packages, you know, to attract veterans and their families, but that's not what is provided by the VA. If if I'm an if I'm right. an individual funeral home and I decide I want to give a free minimum casket to every veteran, that doesn't mean my fu the funeral home down the street does that. That's my <laughs> you throw his toy. No, I just threw a pen because brain's oh broken. These guys door open. Oh God. So, um yeah. but you know, so so there's a lot of assumption that because funeral home A has a veterans discount or has a free this for a veteran that every funeral home does, but they don't. So there's just so much out there about veterans and death benefits that's that's incomplete or just wrong. So yeah. if I could if I could say one thing, my my one thing is just research it before that would before the time comes and go in there with education yeah. and yeah. know what what to expect because we have seen Carrie and I both so many times families just devastated by the fact that they do have to pay for funeral services and they're not prepared veteran. and they weren't prepared because their whole life they thought well dad's a veteran yeah and it's just not that it's way so, so. Sad. yeah well, thank you guys for joining us for this yeah. episode of six feet under exhumed the brotherhood next week will be episode gosh what number episode eight eight um crossroads so yeah. we get into ooh, we get into more of the funeral director hands-on stuff next mm -hmm. week um might have a guest host next week we'll see about oh, that yeah because yeah, that'll be fun to start mixing them you don't just have to listen to Faith and I talk. You can Yeah, we'll we'll get talk. some we'll get some other voices in here too yeah. that that kind of have special special interests or special skills to, well, to give their viewers. I think we need to we'll mix in some viewers at times if yeah. you know, you've reached out to me and say, Hey, I would love to be on your show, which a couple of you have. We'll start having I think that's fun too. A very non funeral person perspective on some yeah. of these episodes can really mix us up. I love it. Absolutely. Yep. So, thank you guys for joining us. Send us questions and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye, Bye. everybody. Thank you. Bye.